Good evening, folks, and welcome to tonight's City Council meeting and Committee of the Whole meeting. The City Council meeting is called to order, and I kindly ask our City Administrator, Ms. Dawkins, to please take the roll call. Bruno? Here. Burkhart? Ruby? Here. Caven? Here. Kilberg? Here. Kosserog? Here. Maladra? Here. Marks? Here. Mayor? Here. Swanson? Here. We begin our City Council meetings with the Pledge of Allegiance. I would like to invite... Uh, Restaurant tour extraordinaire, Marshall, to please lead us in the pledge. You thought I was going to say something else? <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. Item four, folks, amendments to the agenda. Are there any amendments this evening? Item five is the omnibus agenda. All items marked with an asterisk are considered to be routine by this city council and can be enacted with one motion. Is there such a motion? Mr. Swanson makes that motion. Second. Seconded by Mr. Marks. Whenever the uh, city administrator is ready, please take the roll call. Bruno? Aye. Ruby? Aye. Caven? Aye. Kilberg? Aye. Kosserog? Aye. Maladra? Aye. Marks? Aye. Mayor? Aye. Swanson? Aye. The omnibus agenda has been approved with nine votes in the affirmative, zero votes in the negative, and one absent. We jump down all the way to number 10, folks, municipal bills for payment. We kindly ask the city administrator to read the bills in their aggregate for our consideration. Okay, municipal bills for payment total $3,834,261.07. Mayor, I move that we approve and pay the bills as read. The individual items that add up to that amount can be found in tonight's packet on the city website. Mr. Bruno makes the motion to pay the bills as presented, which are available in the city council's packets and on the city of Geneva website. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Kosarog. Any questions or comments regarding any of the bills as presented? Ms. Dawkins. Ruby. Aye. Caven? Aye. Kilberg? Aye. Kosserog? Aye. Maladra? Aye. Marks? Aye. Mayor? Aye. Swanson? Aye. Bruno? Aye. The bills have been approved with nine affirmative votes, zero nay votes, and one absent. All items under number 11 have been already approved under the consent agenda. Therefore, we jump to item 12. Item 12A, consider ordinance number 2022-62, amending Title IV, Business and License Regulations, Chapter 2, Liquor Control, Section 4-2-13, license, fees, and number, adding one class B3 liquor license for alchemist. Is it the alchemist or alchemist? I'll go with alchemist. We're going with uh, so, the other Yeah, yeah, I'm with you on that one, man. Alchemist, located at 477 South 3rd Street, Suite 100, Geneva, Illinois. Is there a motion? So moved. Mr. Swanson makes the motion. Second. Mr. Caven makes the second. We do have the applicant with us tonight. I will defer to the dais as to whether or not there are any questions or comments for the applicant. Ms. Dawkins, do you have a precursor you'd like to share? No, I think most of it's covered in the motion. Looking for a liquor license, uh, B3, which is a restaurant with cocktail lounge uh, for MBS Hospitality, doing business as Alchemist. Um, and then I would note that uh, if this is approved this evening, the license would not be issued until they have their occupancy permit from the building division. Mr. Bruno. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just uh, wanted to give the uh, petitioners an opportunity to come talk about their business uh, in front of the <coughs> millions and millions of people watching. <laughs> well, thank you all. You guys are very efficient. I, I was like, wow, we're already at the, uh, at the R opportunity here. I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to appreciate the opportunity to, to be here with you all today. I want to introduce my business partner and brother-in-law, uh, Devin Bierman, um, for this and endeavor. And brother-in-law. Yes. Oh, yeah. Which is more important, I'm not sure yet. We'll find out <laughs> as we get into operations here. But, um, but also wanted the opportunity just to, to be in front of you all and thank you all for the last four years of our operation at the Walrus Room. Um, you know, four years ago, I stood up here as a wide-eyed and um, first business owner and operator and have learned many lessons since. And there's been many ups and downs, um, as we've all experienced together. Um, but wanted the opportunity also just to say thank you to, to you all for how we've kind of 
tra transferred from then to now and and how things have gone and i i can't imagine being in a a city that was more accommodating to to what we were trying to accomplish through COVID and through all the other things that we've had to to get through um we've we're stronger now than we'd ever been and um I think that what we hope to present to to Geneva here in the in the coming months will just be an addition to what is already a great business community. Um, we're super excited to offer Alchemist to the dining and and drinking pleasures of of our community. Um, Alchemist, we hope to present a great cocktail and fine wine experience, elevated uh, food food offerings. Um, we want to just add to what is already a great third street experience um, that i think has just continued to develop since since i've been in town my family moved here seven years ago um, we've got a young one in in the schools and uh, just couldn't be more excited to continue to expand what we have to offer um, gene evans and we appreciate the work that you all do to to help us accomplish those things Microphone, Mike. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for investing in the city. Uh, just for clarity for everyone listening, you are uh, in the space formerly occupied by Galena Winery. Is that yep, correct? Yep, absolutely. Dodson Plaza, um, 477 uh, South 3rd Street, uh, Suite 100. And do you have a uh, targeted uh, uh, opening date? Yeah, with all things considered, but we hope to be open in mid-January. Um, uh, there's still a few things to, to be completed, but we're right there at the finish line and are excited to, to get operations going. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, it's Instagram famous now because you posted on Instagram. <laughs> we have, yeah, we're officially, it's official. It's official. It felt, yeah. it did feel like there was Was that kind of weird? Of, like, yeah, pressing the send was like, Yeah, I could oh, imagine. I could imagine. It's certainly official now. So. Anyone else from the dais? Well, Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we haven't voted yet, so hang up. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> we won't hold our breath yet. Thank uh, you. A motion to take a break for a couple hours before we can see this. <laughs> nope. Okay. Any additional questions or comments for Ms. Dawkins, myself, or the applicants? Ms. Dawkins, roll call vote, please. Caven? Aye. Kilberg? Aye. Kosrog? Aye. Maladra? Aye. Marks? Aye. Mayor? Aye. Swanson? Aye. Bruno? Aye. Ruby? Aye. With a vote of nine in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and one absent, you've been issued the B3 license as requested. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank Feel free to sneak out if you need to. <laughs> you want to wait to comment on that, or you can stick around for the remaining? Oh, that's nice. Motion to consider annexing St. Charles. Is there a no? Item B, consider resolution number 2022-105, authorizing the execution of a utility easement located at 33 West 461 Roosevelt Road. So moved. Mr. Bruno makes the motion. Second. Seconded by Mr. Marks. Ms. Dawkins. Okay, so the property owner has ded dedicated an easement to cover an underground line and vault that has been in place since 1995. Uh, the easement was agreed upon during original construction, but was never recorded. Uh, so if there are any other questions, we do have Superintendent Holton with us this evening. Mr. Kosrog. I just had one question. What does vault mean? Uh, what, is, what is a vault? Well, like, yeah, in this case. Yeah, so it's, a, it's an underground uh, concrete structure that we use uh, as a pulling point for cable. So cable comes in to it from one direction and then it goes out in a different direction in this case. Pretty basic. Yep. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The motion passes with nine affirmative votes, zero nay votes, and one absent. Item C, 12C. Consider resolution number 2022-106, awarding bid and contract to LNS Electric for the Kesslinger Road and Del Nor substation maintenance project in the amount of 85,560 bucks. So moved. 
Mr. Kilberg makes the motion. Second. Seconded by Ms. Mayor. Ms. Dawkins. Okay, as you uh, may have read in the agenda packet, the substation maintenance project was first bid in October, but all bids were rejected, either being in excess of budget or non-conforming to the bid specifications. The project was rebid earlier this month with two bids received, and the low bid was from LNS Electric in the amount of $85,560, which includes the option to repair the load tap changer at the Del Nor substation. If approved, work would begin mid to late March and conclude in early April. And again, we still have Superintendent Holton with us to answer any additional questions. Questions from Mr. Holton, the load tap changer expert. Pardon me? Do we want to know what that is? I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> Marshall, do you know what a load tap changer is? Okay, we have a motion, we have a second, folks. Ms. Dawkins, please take the roll. Kilberg? Aye. Kosterog? Aye. Maladra? Aye. Marks? Aye. Mayor? Aye. Swanson? Aye. Bruno? Aye. Ruby? Aye. Caven? Aye. With nine votes in the affirmative, zero votes in the negative, and one absent, item 12C has been approved by this council. Item 13 is new business and public comment. Anyone joining us this evening here in the audience wish to address the council on any issue? Anyone online, folks? Public comment? New business, Mr. Kilberg. Oh, uh, I just uh, want to uh, acknowledge that Siobhan Lambelot will be leaving the uh, uh, Park District after over 15 years of service uh, to the community in that role. She'll be le leaving the community, relocating to South Carolina, but uh, uh, I would hope that, uh, I would hope that uh, if you have an opportunity to see her, I think next week will be the last week, but as a as a community, I want to thank her for her service and, uh, and leadership uh, in that uh, important uh, function for the community. So that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Mayor. Uh, I was just wondering if we were going to be announcing the winners of the, of the uh, decorating contest. The winner of the staff holiday decorating contest will not be announced until tomorrow. And that announcement will come from our human resources director, Mira Johnson. However, you and I and the other judge, Mr. Malada, know who that winner is. And there were two categories, individual and group. And the individual actually is from St. Charles, so that's kind of exciting. No, it's actually an office in St. Charles. No. <laughs> but good, I can't post anything until she makes the announcement. So it's very exciting. Ben, anything you want to add regarding your necklace? <laughs> All right, well, that's good for you. Anyone else? <laughs> How about a motion to adjourn the council meeting? So motion by Kosarog. All in favor, please say aye. 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 We're adjourned, folks. Give us one minute to transition to the committee of the whole meeting. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the committee of the whole meeting. Tonight is Monday, December 19th, 2022. My name is Amy Mayer. I'm the alderman of the fourth ward along with Gabe Caven. And I'm calling this meeting to order. For, uh, number two on the agenda is no, Just say everyone's here but Burghardt. Everyone's here but uh, Alderman Burghardt. I am going to recommend suspending the rules to permit council member mayor to chair this meeting and to vote on all action items on this agenda. All in. Need a motion. And a second. Second. Moved by Kaven, second by Kasarog. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. Who's taking the notes so that I'm. You are? Okay. Um, need item number three approve regular committee of the whole minutes from December 5th, 2022. So moved. Moved by Bruno. Second. Second by Swanson. We'll move on to all in favor. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Any opposed? Nobody opposed. Item four, four A, consider draft resolution authorizing the purchase of a range advanced training simulator from Milo in the amount of 
in the amount not to exceed 29,975. Can I get a motion? So moved. moved by Marx. Second. Second by Bruno. Um, would you like me to say a few? Yes, would you okay. please say a few? So the fiscal year 23 budget includes funds for the purchase of a firearm simulator. Three quotes were secured with Milo as the low quote in the amount of $29,975. The purchase of a simulator will allow officers to participate in critical training as it relates to the decision-making process when responding to critical incidents. In addition, the recently passed Safety Act mandates additional training in proper and constitutional use of force and de-escalation strategies and training. The use of a simulator such as this is specifically addressed by the Illinois Law Enforcement Training and Standards Board as a means to meet the training mandates called for in the Safety Act. Uh, we do have with us the uh, chief. I was going to say some adjective there, and I, sorry, <laughs> tripped over that. So we have Chief Pastorelli here. If there's any additional questions you might have. I just, I just. Alderman uh, Marks. Just, just a quick, easy question. Uh, is this a large piece of equipment? I mean. It's a large screen. Okay, it's um, just a screen. So I think it's probably close to about the, the size here. Okay. Freestanding inside the building has, uh, we have plenty of space for it. You do? Yeah. Okay. That's all I wanted to know. I thank didn't you. know where, what, it, what, what it was. I mean, how it would work. That's why I was questioning. So thank you. You're welcome. Uh, first, Alderman Bruno, then Alderman Rudy. Ruby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief. The uh, I had done uh, some years back. Uh, joined in some of your training on your previous one. It, it, I looked at the video online. Is this basically the next gen of? That? It's very similar to that one. Um, has 800 different programmable scenarios that you'll be able to use and we have we've used it for Citizen Police Academy before um, we've allowed council members to go through and have the opportunity to to train on it so yeah it is a little more advanced because they've included a lot of de-escalation scenarios which is what's required by the Safety Act so a good portion of the scenarios available to us will allow us to practice those skills as well it's uh, it's much harder than Grand Theft Auto <laughs> yes it is <laughs> it is Thank you. You're welcome. Alderwoman Ruby. Thank you. Um, I was just curious how frequently you think this will be used. Is this an item that you'll utilize daily, weekly? I think we have the potential to use it daily. Okay. Um, there's training for six instructors with the purchase. Um, our goal would be to use our firearms instructors to be trained along with some others. So if there's a shift where we're over minimums, or there's just availability to have it in our building will allow the officers just to run through some scenarios on shift so we'll be able to use it quite frequently okay yeah. I, I was wondering about um, you know if st. Charles or Batavia maybe had something if this is something that um, could be a, a community you know multiple community shared piece but it but if we're planning to use it that frequently that doesn't sound like an option correct okay right thank now. you yeah. you're welcome Alderman Kilberg uh, as it relates to the Safety Act, did the state legislature uh, provide any funding to support uh, <laughs> upgrades as it relates to uh, this technology? No, not for this. They did not. So the only thing that they've... Is, is this an unfunded mandate? This would be an unfunded mandate, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Anyone else from the dais? Seeing none, sensing none, let's vote. Uh, okay. Kosrog? Aye. Maladra? Aye. Marks? Aye. Mayor? Aye. Swanson? Aye. Bruno? Aye. Ruby? Aye. Caven? Aye. Kilberg? Aye. Thank you. Unanimous. Uh, item 4B, consider draft resolution authorizing the purchase of three 2023 Ford Police Interceptor vehicles, police vehicles, including related equipment and exterior graphics in an amount to ex an amount not to exceed $161,908 sorry $161,908.74 so moved second seconded by Casarog Okay, so the uh, fiscal year 23 budget includes funds for the purchase of three 2023 Ford Police Interceptor sports utility vehicles as scheduled replacements. 
Ford has discontinued production of the Interceptor sedan and only offers the Interceptor sports utility vehicle. The state of Illinois bid holder for the Ford Interceptor is Sutton Ford Incorporated out of Madison, Illinois, and the total cost of the project includes the price of the vehicles, along with the removal, transfer, and purchase of equipment from Ultrastrobe Communications and the application of police exterior graphics by EB Graphics. With us this evening is Deputy Chief Dean to answer any additional questions that you may have. Kosarov. Alderman Kosarov. <clears throat> hey, Deputy Chief. Hi. Um, I was just wondering how delivery is going on these vehicles. You know, there were a lot of delays and things like we heard last year. Are we, when are we expecting these to be in? Yeah, extremely slow is the answer to that question. Yeah. Um, you know, currently we have one that is scheduled to be delivered to us. Uh, some of it is reliant on Ford themselves. The other one is the, the delivery from the dealerships. So <clears throat> by the time we get these ordered, um, I wouldn't expect uh, us to have them until uh, probably towards the end of uh, 2023. Oh, wow. So like 12 months. Okay. I think that was my only question. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Kilberg. These are firm numbers. They're not subject to change uh, uh, at some point in time in 2023. No, the, the biggest cost of, of the um, project is the cars themselves. Right. Uh, so th those those are fixed. Um, okay. the, uh, the, the, re the remainder of it is based on numbers that we got from Ultrastrobe and EB, EB Graphics, and those quotes just came in within the last few weeks. So only this, I think, the graphics piece is fairly small. It's like what about fifteen hundred dollars per vehicle? I think, or it's actually a little little under that. So yeah, it's, it's about a thousand dollars per vehicle. Yeah. And the other one again to refresh my memory, the uh, the uh, purchase of equipment. We're not able to transfer the technology then from existing interceptors to the new vehicles, or is this going to be all new equipment then that goes in? Uh, it'll, it will probably be a mix between the two. There will be a lot of equipment from the existing vehicles that will be transferred over. Um, <clears throat> that's part of that. So it's the, the removal of the equipment from the, uh, the old squad cars, the transfer of that into the new ones, any of the equipment that can be used over will be. What would be the approximate cost of the technology that we, that's incorporated into it? Uh, so in, let's say 45000 is the cost of the vehicle. And we talked about the, um, the graphics and then the, do you, do you have a rough idea what that might be? Those range between ten and $11,000 for okay. the ultra -show. Okay, that's all I had. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Shall we move? Roll call or? Sure, call. Um, voice vote. All in, favor. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No, it passes. Um, item D. C. C. Consider draft resolution waiving competitive bidding and authorizing the execution of a service partnership agreement with HACH for the water and wastewater plants at a cost of $20,100. Can I have a motion, please? Second. Alderman Marks and Second. Alderman Bruno. <clears throat> Okay, so the water treatment and wastewater treatment plants have hack analyzers and probes. Staff rely on this equipment to continuously monitor such things as chlorine and fluoride levels in the drinking water and dissolved oxygen, pH, and suspended solid levels at the wastewater plant. This equipment communicates with the SCADA system to control feed pumps, turbo blowers, and other equipment. Uh, staff has negotiated an annual service agreement for both treatment facilities, and the equipment is proprietary and can only be certified by Hatch service representatives. With us this evening is Superintendent Van Gescom, if you have any additional questions. Anyone? Alderman I just Gilbert. had one question. Does this require uh, samples to be sent out, or is this going to provide us with instant uh, information as yeah. it relates to what might be going on with our water or waste yeah it's it's instant in, uh, information it controls uh, different uh, types of equipment at the plant to make adjustments so uh, the benefit for us is is mainly during off hours so it automatically makes those adjustments so it doesn't upset 
oh, okay. the wastewater plant or it doesn't cause us problems in the in the drinking water okay so this these are these are fixed pieces then yes okay thanks anyone else from the dais let's take a voice vote uh, all in favor say aye. aye aye any opposed it passes Item D, consider draft resolution authorizing acceptance of a proposal from GovHR USA LLC for a classification and compensation study in an amount not to exceed $35,500. So moved. Second. Second by Casero. Okay, so the standard industry practices recommend that in order to remain competitive, compensation should be reviewed every three to five years. In addition, the City of Geneva's adopted compensation and classification plan document states that compensation will be reviewed every five years. The City of Geneva conducted a joint classification and compensation study um, in conjunction with the City of Batavia in 2017. With COVID-19 and pending retirements driving an increasingly competitive job market, a review of the current plan is essential if the city intends to continue to fill key positions that become vacant by recruiting the most qualified talent. The city received six responses to the compensation study request for proposals. Three firms were interviewed, and the re recommendation from the interview team is that GovHR of Northbrook, Illinois, provided the most responsive submittal as they met the evaluation criteria listed in the RFP, possess a track record of good performance with neighboring and comparable communities, have positive professional reference checks, and offered the best value with minimal additional fees. Uh, with us this evening is HR Generalist Johnson um, and also Assistant City Administrator McCready, who can answer any additional questions you might have. Alderman Swanson. Thank you. I'm not sure who this question is for, uh, but in 2017, we did a joint study with Batavia, and I believe the cost was 16000 to Geneva. In 2021-2022, St. Charles did their own, and they budgeted 50000 and the cost was less than 25000 And now we're going on our own in 2022, and the cost is 35000 So my first question is, given that we have so much collaboration with St. Charles and Batavia, why didn't we again try to do this with them, given that our peers are all the same, and there appears to be quite a quite a savings to be able to do this together. I'm not sure in terms of St. Charles, I believe it was over 30,000 for their study that they recently did. Um, and I'm not sure in how in depth it was for us this time, we're going to be doing a salary survey and we're going to be coming up with comparable communities. And we're also going to be looking at our scale. So we're going to be looking at the minimum and maximum along with the job descriptions as well. The study in 2017, I wasn't here, but from what I understand, it was more of a market study. So they did a salary survey and they essentially brought people who were below market, which is about the 50th percentile um, in our case, to market. So they didn't really look at job descriptions and where that where the scale fell and, and whatnot so this is a more in-depth analysis or look at our at our system and with COVID-19 since I've been here I've kind of filled about 20 positions some with retirement and some with people moving on and the market has changed drastically um, since 2017 um, it's becoming increasingly difficult to fill positions, especially middle management positions, like for example, our building commissioner position that we just had, that was vacant. We only got four applicants, and one was an internal applicant. Um, our fleet supervisor that's recently became vacant, we've gotten zero applications so far. So I think that's an indication of the job market and also uh, the fact that we need to look at where we're at, because we may be a little bit out of whack. I, I understand that we could be out of whack. I, I know that St. Charles compared theirs to 18 different peers. I know ours was 12, and we asked for 12. I, I guess looking at the executive summary, it, it said that six firms responded to the RFP, and then we invited three back. Can you share what the ranges of the proposed fees were for some of those? Sure. For, for so, all of them. 
Yes. Sure. So um, at the top end, we had um, 83000 Four hundred and thirty, four hundred and eighty-four dollars. Um, the second firm was a fifty-five thousand, and that was actually the firm that that got the bid last time in twenty seventeen. Um, and then J E R H R Group, they were at forty-two seven hundred. Then we had Paypoint H R, they were at thirty-seven thousand five hundred. Gov H R was at thirty-five thousand. 500 and then Baker Tilly was at 31,100. Okay. Um, one of the questions that was asked by the RFP responding firms was, what have you budgeted for this? And we responded, it was 30,000 plus some more for Tricom. And imagine that, but then most of the bids came in at that level. Do we ever say we would prefer not to share what we budgeted and instead just go in blind and say we would prefer that you tell us what you think it's going to cost? Seems like we gave them what our floor was. And that's just a question of... Well, it's all public record. It's all online. It's all there. So... Understood. I, I, I guess we handed it to them. But so, okay. I understand. And, and my final question is, we are looking at this for 156 employees, which is pretty much our entire employee base. And so are we including our union contracted employees as well? No, this is for non-union um, employees only, not okay. our union employees. So the 156 that was in the documents, that, that would include union, would it not? So I thought we were at 151 employees. I think, I, know, I think the, what you're referencing was there was um, a question in the document information provided of how many employees we had, but there was other parts of, that, of, of the RFP where they talk about the positions and looking at the positions and then looking at the individuals and those positions. So, On um, page I, 32, it says 68 positions in the organization and five with TRICOM. Okay, so, so it, it, 68, okay. So, and then looking at the references that were provided by GovHR, most of them were for similar sized cities or larger. For example, St. Charles, they looked at 80 positions. We're looking at 68. Um, Dedham, Massachusetts, which is larger than us, was 90. Lincolnwood, Illinois was 33. Lyle, 33. So, so why, why is our employee count so much higher than other municipalities? I guess we don't know what positions they did in other municipalities. We don't know if it was all in positions, if it was only certain departments. Um, I, I can't answer that question without calling every organization and saying, how many employees do you have? How many are union? How many are non-union? What was your study for? Not everybody always does all employees at once. So I don't, I don't, we don't have an answer for that. Okay. Uh, fair, fair enough. It just, it, it, to me, it seemed like it was an eye-popping amount that we're, we're trying to do to pay here for this consulting agreement. So I was just trying to figure out why. I, mean, I understand why we're doing it, but it's, this particular project seems very high-priced. So I, I will say the last study was more of a market study, so more of just a salary survey. This, I would say, we, we're going to look at job descriptions, and we're going to say, you know, are you, do you, where do you fit? Are you, you know, is there everything in here in your job description? So it's more, much more comprehensive. And I believe with the retirements that we have coming down the pike and with the vacancies and the job market that we have now, I think it'll it definitely set us up to, to fill positions and get the best candidates. I, I would like us to, to go back to trying to do things with the other communities in the Tri-Cities. I think there are savings to be achieved there. So I think in the future, given that we're all kind of on the same four or five year cycle, we should strongly encourage that we do that again in four to five years. So, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Alderwoman Ruby. Thank you. Um, so it sounds like there's a lot more to this than just salaries. Um, but thinking of the salary, I, I feel really conflicted knowing that if we find out that 
we need to increase the salaries of everybody, where, where does that come from? You know, I feel like we're going to pay to get this information, and then there's nothing we can do with it. Well, I th think the consultant will have some recommendations. Um, and sometimes it's not necessarily all, all the positions or all, the, all the, the, the ranges that need to be adjusted. It might be just some. Um, so I think we don't know until we get the results. And then it'll be up to you to decide. A lot of the times, some people do it in tiers. And I believe that's what you did last time, where you said, OK, this is how much Need, people need to be adjusted, or this position needs to be adjusted $5,000. We'll, this fiscal year will do 2500 and next, next fiscal year will do 2500 and then they will be up to market um, it, with our comparable communities. Okay. So, And the position that you mentioned, um, the vacancy we have that we've had zero applicants for, mm -hmm. what, what do we do with that? I mean, do we... Do we just try to increase that salary to try to attract applicants, or well, is it the job? Is it the job itself? I just posted it a few weeks ago, but typically I have at least a few applications, so I have some tricks up my sleeve. In the next few weeks, we'll see um, where if I can post it on some specialty specialty websites. And it's also the holidays, okay. so people are like, I'll apply afterwards. So we'll we'll see. Okay, thank you. Alderman Kilberg. Hi, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, just so I have a better understanding as it relates to the drafting of job descriptions and the updating of job descriptions, and again, this doesn't probably involve a great deal of, of money, but I'm saying to draft a job description for $500, what what all goes into the drafting of a $500 job description? And this would probably be for a new position. And the other ones, I think, were, what, $200 for the updating of an existing job description? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, in industry, usually the manager I, I was responsible for drafting the job description. You take a piece of paper and you put down a number of bullet points, then you give it to legal to take a look at it to see if you covered everything. Mm -hmm. And you had the and any other responsibilities involved with the job as designated by your manager. That was sort of the last bullet point. So it's, tell me a little bit about why we would outsource uh, job descriptions and, and what's the benefit and what's the process that job descriptions go to before they go into place. Okay. Um, so just to be clear, I think they included that. We did not ask for that essentially. Um, right now, we do it in-house. Oh, okay. So right now, when a position becomes vacant, the manager looks at the job description, and they fill out a questionnaire, and they send it back to me, and I update the job description, and I send it back to them, and we take a look at it. We look at all the points, everything that you described, and then we say, okay, looks good, time to post the job, and we move along our merry way. Okay. Um, well, yeah, in so, other words, that's a service that we're not going to use, but they provided pricing for well, it. Well, I, I won't say we're not going to use it. So if we find, back um, to what Alderman said, if we find the, this fleet supervisor, if we can't fill it, or they're saying that it's not, it's out of line or out of whack, it's a very technical position in this market, um, if, if that's, we'd have to take a look and see. If it's more than my expertise or more than um, assistant city administrator McCready's expertise. So, that, um, so there may be one or two that we might find that might be unicorns. But uh, at the same time, right now, I look, even if, if it's a new position or it's a promotion or something like that, it, same process. It goes to the department head or the manager. They fill out the questionnaire. I craft the job description. We work together on it. It gets approved. The job gets posted, and we move forward. So do all our job descriptions, as it relates to this discussion, relate then with the price range on the job description? If somebody, an applicant says, can I see a job description? And then would it have a, a salary range in there? Or is that something that's negotiated or revealed at a later point in time? No, we have a we have a, a, a pay plan, and everybody has they're put in a certain area in the pay plan, and so yes, so, and as as um, as Stephanie Dawkins said, City Administrator Dawkins said, 
everything is public. Okay, it, so so that salary range is a part of the job description if a candidate would ask for a job description. Yes, and when I post it, I post the salary range. So people know, okay, I'm applying for a fleet mechanic. This is the bottom of the range. This is the top of the range. Okay. That's all I had. Thank you. Alderman Kasserad. I had just had a question about um, including diversity, inclusion, and equity in the study. Um, I only found one reference that said making sure they're equitable for the next 10 years. So I, I feel like with um, our uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion task force and other things, is this something, an opportunity now to concentrate on that a little bit more than just kind of one word that sort of seems like an afterthought um, and make sure we're leading the way if need be in in the region? Well, in terms of pay, I mean, I, I think there are other ways that we can do it and um, Assistant City Administrator McCready and I have been working on um, like a diversity, equity, inclusion statement um, for the web, for our HR website. So when, you know, we have a job posting up, instead of saying Geneva is an equal opportunity employer, we say Geneva welcomes diverse and minority candidates. People are encouraged to apply, um, not necessarily just based on their education, but based on their life experiences as well. So I think we're working on that portion of it. And, and I, I think we, we should be set up and also we have our DEI task force that they are working on other things that they would suggest in the future whether it's a uh, um, 180 evaluation or self evaluations or um, complete implicit bias training or things like that um, that can also factor in, in in DEI and I don't know I was just gonna ask, I mean um, in, in terms of looking at compensation and using the term equitable many times what we're looking at is looking at a different functions through throughout the organization. Um, everyone has an important role to play here at Geneva every day, but it's it's trying to look at the skills, um, look at how those skills are compared to skills in other departments, what's required to do the job, and it's it's looking apart across very diverse operations within the city and seeing, you know, how does how does a fire lieutenant and what what skills they need to be successful in their job compare to someone who's a wastewater treatment plant operator and what skills or credentials they might need to do. And so we're, we're not necessarily, um, you know, saying one division or one part department or one um, function is more important than the other, but looking at how we adequately accommodate people knowing um, that there is a lot of variety in what people do here. And it's, that's part of where the consultant and looking and digging into those job descriptions helps of really taking an objective look, um, using our scoring system, looking at our classification plan to see how this translates throughout the organization. And um, to maybe some comments we've heard earlier, looking at our collective bargaining agreements and looking at how compensation between supervisors, non-supervisors, and other, and other positions relate to each other. Um, um, I don't think Mayor has touched on it yet, but one of the greatest challenges um, that affects recruitment for us, and even internal recruitments, is looking at compression, um, how different contracts then impact non-union positions and making sure that the pay is competitive and making sure that we have people who want to step into supervisory roles, um, take on management roles and take on that. Um, but to your point, um, and to bring it back full circle here, Mara has done a tremendous job um, thus far. We've been working on looking at on, at the DEI front on our website. Um, Mara serves as liaison to the DEI task force, as you know. and rather than necessarily wait for all the recommendations to come forward, she's definitely identified some things that, that we can do now um, to hopefully set us up for success and then wait to see what other recommendations they have. And we also do have a point factor evaluation system, which kind of speaks to equity across the organization. So it asks, for example, um, what degree of education does this position need? And there's a score, you know, technicality, then there's a score related to it. And you, you kind of, and it gives, it gives examples, like does this person, is it a front facing position? Do they have to answer the phones every day and speak to residents? Or is it something, someone that speaks with elected officials? Is it someone that, and then it, it ranks ranks it and then the score spits out it spits out a number at the end and then we all we rank it in the in the comp plan so okay 
I mean, that all sounds great and obviously more than I knew was happening. Um, I just maybe would suggest that we sort of emphasize with them, um, with GovHR, that the equitable job descriptions, you know, it, it maybe that we're really looking for feedback on that as well. If they can, it seems like it's incorporated into the quote already since it's in that. So um, I, I don't know. That would just be my suggestion, and it would be interesting to see if any results became of became of that, whether it was from this conversation or just your own with them. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I was going to add something similar to that, but um, I, I have another thought that I'd like to ask about if if we are having trouble recruiting locally and people that are in this region, do we, do we outreach as well? Um, and on the diversity, equity, and inclusion front, are we reaching into neighborhoods where there's low employment? That's... We haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> We're working on it. We, we, there's so much we can do. We can, you know, if, if, for example, we're not filling a position, we can target affinity groups. We can target the Asian American Association of Engineers. We can, you know, there, there are things that we can do in the, in the future, um, definitely, um, to, to find people. To reach out a bit more. To reach out. But it does start with pay. I, I will say, when someone sees that pay scale, um, and, you know, government has typically been known for great benefits, um, you know, health insurance and a good pension, not necessarily pay. And so it's important to keep up to date with that. Um, and, and that's what hopefully this will do um, from a local government perspective. So. Okay. Does anyone else have any more comments, questions? Should we take a roll call vote? Okay. Maladra? Aye. Marks? Aye. Mayor? Aye. Swanson? Nay. Bruno? Aye. Ruby? Nay. Caven? Aye. Kilberg? Aye. Kosrog? Aye. 7-2. All right, um, item E, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Consider draft ordinance amending Title VIII, Public Ways and Property, Chapter 1, Streets, Sidewalks, and Public Property, Section 5, Encroachments and Obstructions, and 7, Prohibited Acts and Conditions of the Geneva City Code. Can I get a motion? So moved. Alderman Marks, a motion? Second. Bruno with the second. So as requested at a special committee of the whole policy discussion in June, for your consideration are proposed amendments to the Geneva City Code as they relate to right-of-way right encroachments. Um, Director Groot has, uh, present, has a presentation just to give you an overview of the proposed amendments. Thank you. Um, I'm nervous about the presentation because I'm afraid I'm going to stumble over the same word about 50 times. <laughs> so, <laughs> forgive me if I do. Um, so earlier this year, the Committee of the Whole directed staff to prepare a presentation for a policy discussion on our regulations pertaining to encroachments in the right-of-way, specifically to be better understand how many we might have in the community, and then if we want to establish regulations to make accommodations for those encroachments. Um, so that discussion was held back in June, where we presented information on possible encroachments. Um, initially, we had identified 35 possible encroachments. Uh, mostly involving residential properties. Uh, we identified those by looking at property lines overlaid on top of aerial photographs, um, looking at building footprint uh, in relation to the King County base map. Um, but then we took it a step further. Um, after identifying those potential encroachments, we looked in our records to see if we have plats of survey to see if we can confirm if they are encroachments or not. Um, unfortunately, we can only find eight plats of survey, um, which confirmed four of the encroachments, um, and the other four were confirmed to be private improvements. Um, so shown here, this plat confirmed all the buildings are located on private property, but the patio encroaches into the right-of-way. Um, it's just another example. This plat confirmed all the private improvements from a private property, um, despite the aerial photos showing otherwise. 
Um, so at the conclusion of that policy discussion, we presented four options um, for the confirmed encroachments. The first option was to uphold the city code as written, um, not allowing the construction or maintenance of any structure on the public right of way. Um, the committee did not want to pursue this option and instead directed staff to draft amendments um, in order to provide non-conforming provisions for existing encroachments, allowing ordinary maintenance and repair. Um, identify the possibility of vacating public right-of-way um, to accommodate existing encroachments and obstructions, provided that doing so would not impact uh, planned public uses. Um, and then to identify the possibility of entering into a licensing agreement to allow the encroachments uh, to continue in the right-of-way. Um, so I thought it might be beneficial just to walk through the amendments as they're drafted in, in the ordinance in your packets. Um, this slide shows the entire section on encroachments and obstructions that exist in the code today. Um, as shown in the red font, we're proposing modifications that would simply remove language prohibiting the maintenance of the existing encroachments. And then we would add on the next slide um, a section C. Um, in this section and its subsections propose regulations for existing encroachments and obstructions. Um, this introductory paragraph sets a date of January 1st, 2023 as the cutoff for any existing encroachment to be considered legally nonconforming. Um, and then subject to the, the provisions that will follow in the, in the sections we'll go over in a second. Um, this paragraph also states that the regulations do not apply to electric fences, irrigation lines, encroachments in the street or right away under the jurisdiction of another agency or anything that presents an imminent threat, danger, or hazard to the public. <coughs> so subsection one allows for the ordinary or minor repairs and alterations to be made, uh, provided that those repairs or renovations costs don't exceed 25% of the market value of the building or structure. Um, with an exception for fences and walls, those can be replaced in sections of less than 50% of the total area of, encroaching into the right of way. And then subsection two states that the existing encroachments cannot be expanded or enlarged in a manner which further encroaches into the right of way. Subsection three states that an existing encroachment cannot be moved in whole or in part to any other portion of the right of way. So if you're going to relocate it, it should be relocated onto private property. Uh, this is a very long paragraph, but it um, outlines that a building destroyed by or damaged by an act of God cannot be restored in a manner which encroaches into the street unless the cost of the rest restoration is less than 50% of the value of the building um, encroaching into the right of way. It's very similar language that we have for non-conforming buildings on private property in the zoning ordinance. Um, and then this subsection five outlines the rights of an owner uh, to petition the city if they cannot comply with their previous sections um, to either vacate the right of way, uh, the necessary portion of the right of way to allow their encroachment to continue or to enter into a licensing agreement to allow the continued use of the public way. And then the final subsection here states that any encroachments shall not be expanded, renewed or altered if they interfere with a permitted public use, including sidewalks, control, traf traffic control devices, that's the one I'll trip on, public utilities, and that the city is not liable for any costs or damage to an existing building or encroachment resulting from one of the permitted uses for the public right of way. And then the final amendment you'll see in the draft ordinance um, is not necessarily directly related, but we wanted to take this opportunity to clarify that the staging of equipment, material, or debris in the public right of way overnight is prohibited. Um, unless we otherwise permit it with a right-of-way permit. Um, so I know it's been a few months since we had that policy discussion. It took us some time to draft the language, um, but we, we have reviewed it um, amongst department heads, the Public Works Department, and, and the City's Legal Council, and we recommend approval as we have them drafted, and we're available to answer any questions you may have. Alderman Swanson. Thank you. Um, I had an example oh, a year and a half ago, and I'd like to walk through what would happen to that example under these proposed changes. And that was a porch that was 12 inches into the right-of-way that the homeowner wanted to replace the porch and could not. 
Now, what, what I'm seeing here is that that would not qualify as ordinary repairs, although the, the cost of that porch would be nowhere near 50% of the cost of the home. So I don't know if that applies there or not. So in this scenario, if it's not ordinary repairs, would that then revert to number five, the right to petition, or could they replace that porch? So the complete removal of the porch and replacement would not be allowed because that's, that's removing the entire structure um, and its entire value. But if the entire were, structure being the porch, the not porch. the house. Okay, Cor just correct. the, okay. Um, so then it would have to be located on private property. And if they really needed that 12 inch encroachment and felt like they could not make the porch work otherwise, they could then go to number five and petition to either vacate that portion or enter into a licensing agreement. Okay, so, so the new rules would allow them a recourse, which is the petition. Walk me through the pe petition process. Who do they petition to and who adjudicates it? Um, so we went through a, a vacation um, colony drive, a plot of vacation. So that is a petition um, that came through our department and was brought to the city council for consideration to vacate that right of way. Um, a licensing agreement. They would petition again through our department and we can work with our legal counsel to draft a licensing agreement then to bring to the council for consideration. So the city council is ultimately the decider. It's not going to PZC. Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Alderman Bruno. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The, uh, uh, I, I think it, it, it feels like a, a good and reasonable step toward dotting some I's and crossing some T's on the issue. Um, and this this would probably be picking nits. Uh, the reference to electric fence, uh, I presume this is like the uh, dog containment uh, invisible fence type thing. Right. If we're doing our utility work in the right of way, we don't want to come across surprises <laughs> such as electric fences, irrigation lines. Uh, I've, I've cut our, elect our, our invisible fence many times. Um, <laughs> But I, I just didn't know if there might be a, a more general term for that. You know, I think of electric fence being like cattle containment. Right. And, but I don't think we want those either. <laughs> no, you don't want those <laughs> that, That's really the only thing that jumped out at me. Thanks. Alderman Kasserag. So um, obviously you studied other communities but um, and incorporated that into here. But I was wondering if you could you know just briefly maybe tell us what is normal and where we're deviating from other communities with these provisions yeah honestly we didn't find much help from other communities um the norm was not to allow any obstructions in the right of way any maintenance of those obstructions in the right of way um and we even caught, came across some um some articles suggesting that we don't <laughs> So the, the norm was definitely not to make accommodations for encroachments in the right of way. Um, then, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming every city has encroachments into the right of way, um, probably because they weren't caught by final inspection or things like that. Would you know, like the front porches? I mean, I know some of it's historic too, but more the modern stuff or the fences and things like that. Yeah, I think um, in our case, most most of them are older structures um, that were done probably before plats of survey were required for every permit or maybe before permits were being pulled. Um, there's certainly obstructions that happen just because a homeowner went out and put in a decorative fence or a landscape feature or something like that as well. So I guess I was just trying to figure out um, what would another city do say about Bob's porch situation? I think that the standard language we found was that if you're if you're replacing that porch, it should be replaced onto private property. Unless there was, like we ran into an issue, um, Caddy Corner from us here at the country house where there, there was nowhere to go. The building was right on the property line and that, that stoop had to be in the right, in the right of way. And then we answered into a licensing agreement. Um, but the porch would have been allowed to, in, in other cities, in sort of maybe the more typical code, would have been allowed to exist, just no modifications, no repair, no license to do anything to it. Right, like, like I said, we didn't really find any kind of non-conforming provisions for public right-of-way encroachments. Yeah. Um, 
And then I guess um, I, I was curious too on the licensing agreement. How it, how it, so is that compensation from the homeowner to the city? Is that what that, what does licensing agreement mean in this case? Um, I think it depends on, on what the encroachment is and what, what hazards it might present for the city and what kind of insurance we might need from, uh, from that property owner. So that's why we left the language kind of loose there, so subject to an agreement reviewed by our legal counsel, because it could vary from case to case. But we could also waive those fees. We could as city council. I, w I don't think we typically not, require compensation. We're looking at insurance requirements. Okay. So that's where I was a little confused. Yeah. So we're not talking about compensation. We're not talking about payment no, for that in line. Generate okay. revenue. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, I don't know. Just hearing this, I'm I'm actually back to kind of not allowing it. Um, I can't. I have no idea what I said back <laughs> six months ago when we were first talking about it. But um, I don't know. It, it seems like such a gray area. I feel like that. Um, I don't know. It it'll be tough. It'll be judgment calls. It'll be it'll be hard. To, to say what should or shouldn't go and things like that. So I'm, I'm not saying I'm dead set on that, but just hearing these options, I wanted to share that with the council. Um, I don't know what any, everybody else thinks. So that's all I have for right now. Uh, Alderman Bruno. If no one else is gonna speak to this, the, uh, what you uh, jarred loose in my aging brain, the, uh, the idea that we put this uh, this date of uh, January 2023 in there, uh, I, I'm sensing a potential for some abuse by if if someone decides, well, maybe I can sneak this in without anyone noticing, no proof when it was built, that they can just run with it without. Penalty. I, I don't know if that's realistic, but popped in my head. So I... that's a 12-day window. What do you mean? It's January 1st, 2023. That's in 12 days. Yeah, I know. That's so, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, no, but they could. But there's a, um, you know, in in this in this coming spring. You know, if someone uh, decided to expand a porch or something, or put in a patio that encroached, um, you know, if they did it under the cover of darkness or something. You know, you can't prove that it wasn't done before. Well, I think That's I think with technology scary. today, we, we can get pretty close. Okay. Yeah. Um, aerial yeah. photos every spring, Google Earth taken. I mean, we can get pretty close to. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we, we put some language in there in the opening paragraph that we may require documentation to demonstrate that it was constructed prior to January 1st, 2023, if there's any question. Thanks. Um, Alderman Maladra. Uh, I appreciate Brad's thinking that that you know allowing this gets us gets us into a bit of a a situation where it, it's kind of hard to tell when you allow something and when you don't. Uh, but what we do know right now is that the this you know a situation like what Bob brought up where. A person just wants to replace what they have exactly as they have it causes as much trouble as anything else I think allowing us the ability to step into the potential sticky situation is an improvement over what we have right now so I think this was a good job anyone else I, I have one uh, clarification that I just I've never seen this uh, written this way. In the encroachment upon a public street, are, are we saying the right of way is the public street as well? I mean, is it right. right of way is included in public street as a term? Correct. Okay. Right. The public way. Um, I think that we talked in depth the first time around about there being all these existing conditions that are quite historic, not not just somebody who went out and built a shed over the property line, but um, in the older neighborhoods of the city where there's encroachments. 
um, and giving it a date certain every time a property changes hands there's a there's a plat of survey that would back up the encroachment or the the problem and then we have Google Earth so it'd be pretty hard to get away with this especially if you were a new owner moving in you would have a plat at closing that would limit your ability to to put an addition on that was encroaching so maybe one thing if if I if you don't mind oh, sure. um, that I'm not getting is this re is the code just retro retroactive for the 34 properties or does it include the uh, the future too does it include you know the homeowner who does his own handyman work built his own porch it would not include that so setting the date is January 1st 2023 is saying that if you if you have an existing encroachment prior to that date you may modify it under these minor ordinary repairs under these conditions but if you constructed that afterwards you did so illegally and we can require you to remove it okay I think I was I was that's where I was a little mixed up I, I, I definitely don't want to get into taking down historic structures or anything like that for a few inches of encroachment um, I just wanted to make sure these options of petitioning the City Council for a licensing agreement aren't a possibility in the future if they knowingly uh, you know encroach on the right away um, obviously it wouldn't be approved in the plan so it would have to be so you can't come to us and ask for a licensing agreement if this happened in 2024 or next summer in as, as drafted no as drafted right. no okay well that makes me definitely feel better on that thank you any other comments from the days uh, voice vote oh. depends on your let's do a roll call vote thank you. Marks? Aye. Mayor? Aye. Swanson? Aye. Bruno? Aye. Ruby? Aye. Caven? Aye. Kilberg? Aye. Kosserog? Aye. Malaja? Aye. All right, it's unanimous. So um, now I'm going to open it up for a public comment and new business. Anyone have anything they'd like to add? Anyone online? No one's online. Surprising. Um, then may I get a motion to go into closed session? There will be. Oh, I got to read the full. Yeah, on okay. pending litigation. On pending litigation pursuant to ILCS 120 slash 2C11 and purchase or lease of real property for the use of the public body pursuant to ILS. ILCS 122C5. May I get a motion to go into close, closed session? Marks with the motion. Second. Second to Swanson. Roll call vote. Mayor? Aye. Swanson? Aye. Bruno? Aye. Ruby? Aye. Caven? Aye. Kilberg? Aye. Kostrog? Aye. Maladra? Aye. Marks? Aye. And I'll add that no action will be taken on any items discussed this evening. I need a motion to go back into regular session. So, so second. Second by Bruno, moved by Marks. Uh, voice vote or roll call? Voice vote, please. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So moved. One more thing to do. If, if I may, before we call for the adjournment, just a reminder, there is no meeting on January 3rd. Our next meeting will be a special committee of the whole meeting on January 9th. So you have the next couple of weeks off to enjoy your holidays. All right. For the benefit of residents, we have a pretty significant snowstorm headed our way, so maybe somebody might want to make a comment as it relates to what, we, what public works might expect uh, uh, from our residents as it relates to parking on the street and in cooperating and working with public works so that we can get the snow plowed because uh, uh, it looks like uh, we're going to have two or three days that are going to be pretty difficult 
So go ahead, Stephanie. We'll say, so there will likely be a parking ban in effect, which comes into effect if we expect more than two inches of snow. But I would uh, suggest that residents continue to check our website. We will be updating the website, and we will be sending out alerts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Uh, Marks, all in favor, say aye. Aye. That's it. Oh, I got to do this. <laughs> <laughs> you get Thank to you do very that. much.